Good morning, everybody. We had a great day at Vacation Bible School yesterday. These kiddos had a fun time learning about when life is unfair, when life is scary, and when God is good. Oh, I meant when life is good. God is good. Sorry. Um, but they want to sing one of their songs for you this morning and show you what a great fun time we had at VBS. You're watching kids. I just want to add to that that it was a great VBS program yesterday and want to thank someone because uh, the Bible tells us to give honor where honor is due. We want to thank Caroline for all of her hard work leading and organizing the VBS. And no offense to Jonathan, but I see where all the brains of the operation is. <laughs> She did an amazing job, but also all of our volunteers, and there's a lot of them, and I don't have enough time to really thank them individually, but thank you to all the volunteers who served yesterday, also all of those who contributed to make it possible. Thank you again for making it a great VBS. And I also want to note that Jeff Hostetter and his wife, who are missionaries we support in Ghana, were able to come by and visit our kids yesterday and talk to them about their mission work. 
uh, and share some other things and uh, want to report to you that we had an offering t t taken up for them yesterday, but we're also going to have a love offering for them next Sunday morning here at church to go with uh, the missionary gift that we're going to give them. So be prepared, if you're able, to give to a love offering for Jeff Hostetter and his ministry in Ghana next week. Uh, and a love offering. And i like to add to that that uh, they're trying to collect hymn books, and uh, Jarvisburg is very blessed to be able to give him a lot of hymn books because many of the churches over there are starving to get hymnals in their hand. And they must sing in different languages, I'm sure, but they're going to have uh, an English version of the hymnals and be able to sing uh, gospel songs and hymn songs with us over there while we're worshiping. So we thank you all for your support. We thank you for the love that you showed our kids, and as you see right now, we have a slide going on, and it was a good time, and I tell you, you know, I, I'm out of shape, I guess, but those kids wore me out, and I'm glad we had great volunteers that can make them laugh, because uh, I can't make them laugh the way some of these other guys did, so we thank you so much for everyone that participated, and be, be on alert, because uh, one year will fly by, the next VBS will come around, and just think about and pray about how you can contribute to next year's VBS. So, once again, great thanks to Caroline and everyone who helped us in VBS today. And I'll turn it over to Gene. Okay. So glad everybody came out to worship today. That was a, that was a surprise right there, seeing those kids do their thing. So, uh, once again, reiterating what uh, Ron said, just thank you so much for all the volunteers and for the parents that brought their kids and uh, bring them to church every Sunday and just... Uh, Thank enough of the Lord to bring them kids and and bring them up right. At this time right now, we're going to ask the men to come forward. This is Building Fund Sunday, and we're going to ask them to come forward and take up that offering, please. Let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this place. Lord, it was built on your word and just uh, continues to, to preach and bring the word to the community. Lord, I just pray for the offering we're about to take up now that's used to pay the mortgage here at this church and pay that off. Lord, just pray that the uh, giving is generous. Lord, how many more things we could do if once this note is paid off and we can uh, just get more ministries and have more things. So, Lord, I just thank you for your love you have for us and the love that each person has as they put money in that plate, Lord, to, to pay that off. So thank you, and uh, Lord, just bless it. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Okay, let's worship the Lord. Let's stand and just raise our voices to him. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to Yeah. 
presence All I feel is I washed away Washed away
tried to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountain, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. The lion and the 
a summer job over at Pine Island. I ride around in a truck. It's got this new touch screen thing and you can connect your phone to it and you just hold the steering wheel and talk to whoever calls you on the phone. Well, we've got this thing going on with my grandchild. He'll call me. I want to talk to granddaddy. And we're trying to teach him how to communicate. You know, not just say words, but communicate. And he's doing really good. And uh, he's got this go-to phrase that he uses, and sometimes I'll pause in our conversation with his two or three words at a time he's singing or saying. Sometimes he'll sing to me, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. And then sometimes he'll sing to me about old McDonald. But on his form, old McDonald's got a shark, and he goes chop, 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 chop. <laughs> and it's neat, man. But his real phrase, when I pause, to re-engage me is to say, Granddaddy, I love you. Granddaddy, I love you. Granddaddy, I love you. And how that blesses my soul that he says that. And I could talk to him for 20, 30 minutes at a time. Me and a little teeny three-year-old just barely turned three, talking on the phone. It's neat. It's very neat. Granddaddy, I love you. A sudden breeze, surprisingly warm, whistles through the leaves, scattered, scattering dust through the lifeless form. And with the breath, breath of fresh air comes the difference. 
when you yin yang, the wind is this image. Laughter is laid in the sculptured cheeks. A reservoir of tears is stored in the soul. A sprinkle of twinkle for the eyes. Poetry for the spirit. Logic, loyalty, like leaves on the autumn breeze, they float and they land and are absorbed. His gifts become a part of him. His majesty smiles at his image. It is good. The eyes open. Oneness. Creator and creation walk in the river, walking on the riverbank. Laughter, purity, innocence, joy. Life unending. Then the tree, the struggle, the snake, the lie, the enticement. Heart torn, lured, soul withdrawn to pleasure, to independence to importance, inner agony, whose will, the choice, death of innocence, entrance of death, the fall, tear stains are mingling with fruit stains, then the quest, Abraham, you will father a nation, and Abraham, tell the people I love them, Moses, you will deliver my people, and Moses, Tell the people I love them, Joshua, you will lead the chosen one. And Joshua, tell the people I love them. Jeremiah, you will build tidings of bondage. But Jeremiah, Jeremiah, remind my children, remind my children that I love them. Finally, empty tomb, spirit descending, hushed angels, a girl. A wound, an egg. The same divine artist again forms a body, this time his own. Fleshly divinity, skin layered on spirit, omnipresence with hair, toenails, knuckles, molars, kneecaps. Once again he walks with man, yet the garden is now thorny. Thorns that are cut, thorns that poison, thorns that, thorns that remain lodged, leaving bitter wounds, disharmony, sickness, Betrayal, fear, guilt, and once again a tree, the snake, the enticement, heart torn, Lord. Once again the question, whose will? Then the choice. Tear stains mingled with blood stains. Relationship restored. Bridge erected. And once again he smiles. It is good. For just as death came by the means of a man in the same way, the rising from the death comes from a me by means of man. For just as all people will die because of their union with Adam, in the same way, all will be raised to life because of their union with Christ. Did you get it? I'm telling you, I love you. I'm telling you, I love you. And I've demonstrated how much I love you. That's our God. And how great is our God. We ask you as men to distribute the loaf and the cup to hold and take together in unison as one. Thank you. Oh, God. 
God, we do love you. Dear God, we ask, we ask for help. We ask that you help us learn how to love you the right way. We love you because you first loved us, and you showed that in a crazy way, an unbelievable way at Calvary. So right now, we, we needed that. We needed Calvary, and we acknowledge that. But help us to love you the right way, dear God. Right now, we come to a time in our service that we think about Calvary, think about that crazy love that you had for us to allow your son to die for us. We want to meditate about that, but at the same time, we have a celebration. We want to celebrate what happened three days later because that's what legitimizes all of this, dear God. We thank you for that. I just pray that we do this in a worthy manner. And it's in his name we pray, amen.
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father God, we bring our love to you now in bringing back a portion of what you so graciously bless us with. May it be used in the way that would be pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. morning. So depending on your age, I'm either going to take you down memory lane or I'm going to give you a history lesson. In 1985, the Coca-Cola company released a brand new formula in their lineup. It was called New Coke. Who remembers this if you were around? Good. And if you're younger, you might have heard of it in documentaries or seen it in shows when they kind of have flashbacks. The Coca-Cola company spent millions of dollars trying to promote the new formula and tried to convince everyone that the new and improved formula was better tasting and better than the old one. And I can tell you, look it up. Yes, sir? Yeah. All wrong? <laughs> yes. If you, if you ever look, if you have time, you have YouTube, look up some of the old advertisements. They were as corny as you can get. And they were convinced that they could convince the American public that new Coke was better than the classic Coke. But if you were around or if you know the history, you know that New Coke was a bust. It did not sell well. Many people protested and discussed and wrote letters to the company. So soon after, very soon after, not even a year, the company re-released their old formula and named it Coca-Cola Classic. And it's called that to this day. Immediately, sales of the classic formula skyrocketed and total disaster was avoided for the company. In fact... The recovery was so good in the year to come that many even today believe that it was not a mistake but a marketing ploy to trick customers into going back and drinking Coke. You know why? Because at the time, Pepsi was beating their butts in the, in the market and in sales. So some people think it was actually trickery that they were trying to put on the American public to get them to buy Coca-Cola again. But I don't believe that's the case. Most likely... I think it was just bad leadership. 
it was bad planning, it was bad decisions made in boardrooms, bad execution of their plan, bad advertising, you name it. And in business, bad leadership can cost you time, it can cost you money, materials, man hours, but bad leadership in a church or in a particular ministry can destroy your witness, thus losing the opportunity to save souls and to minister to others. Companies can rebuild very quickly, usually, after a bad market decision. Look at Coca-Cola. In less than a year, they went from almost destroying their company and brand to becoming the number one selling beverage com company in the world again. But you see, for a church, sometimes bad decisions and big mistakes can ruin a ministry, and it takes years and pr many prayers to rebuild. So today, we're going to talk about what biblical leadership should look like in a church and in any local congregation. Because one of the greatest needs for churches in recent years in America is the need for qualified and Christ-like leadership. And I don't just mean elders and preachers. I mean every type of leadership that we need, every type of thing, every ministry, every type of thing that we need to do to lead someone. The church needs leaders everywhere. We don't just need elders and preachers doing it all, but we need people, regular Christians I hate to use the word regular, but non-staff and non-elder Christians to step up and take these roles. But we are going to focus a little bit on elders, deacons, and ministers of a congregation because these are very important roles. But we want to cover all those who are called into leadership because a godly church is going to have strong moral leadership. And there's two big areas we need to focus on. The first one is personal character. In Scripture, God has laid out a, a lot of moral and spiritual principles that Christians are supposed to follow. However, the leaders of a congregation are called to an even higher degree of characters. Uh, the elders must have godly characteristics because they are the shepherds of the flock, protecting the doctrine and spiritual welfare of the church. Deacons must have godly characteristics because they assist the elders and serve in the physical and practical ministries of the church. And ministers also must have godly characters because they too assist the elders as well as preaching and teaching the word. And a lot of times, whether we like it or not, we are the face of the congregation. We see all these things detailed in what we call the pastoral epistles. In 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, it gives all the listing of the qualifications for elders and deacons. But leadership begins with character. And a lack of integrity among leadership can damage the witness of a church and destroy a ministry and destroy any opportunity we have to connect with the community. And under characteristics, there's several things that leaders need to strive for. And the first one of those is purity. Purity is one of the things we need to strive for as leaders. The lack of purity has been the downfall of many church leaders over the years. And many of you, again, a history lesson for some, a trip down memory lane for others, you might recall the sex scandals of Jim Baker, Jimmy Stewart, or Swaggart, excuse me, not Jimmy Stewart, Jimmy Swaggart, <laughs> and Ted Haggard. You remember those guys? Some of them were a little wishy-washy on their beliefs, but nevertheless, they built up huge ministries with huge followings, and they would baptize many and serve many and, and raise millions of dollars for their ministries, yet what happens when they become impure? It all falls apart. And I've seen many congregations, and some of you have, you've seen many congregations on a smaller level that grow and do great things in the community and baptize many and preach Christ every day. But if a leader falls, whether fair or not, it could destroy the witness of that church. And as I said earlier, some congregations, it kills them. Other congregations, they might survive, but then it takes years of prayer, repentance, and building to get back to where they were, to serving God. You see, all this can be avoided by listening to the word of God, and particularly the words of Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. He says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. This is for all Christians, but it does start at the leadership and trickles down. So if you ever are leading or want to lead, you've got to understand that these type of things that Paul lists, if these are things in your life and they keep creeping up, and one day they might destroy your ministry, and they might destroy your witness for Christ. So we have to heed 
Paul's word that leaders and all those seeking to be leaders need to have purity. Another one is sincerity. The big picture is that church leaders will never be perfect. And when there is a mistake, the important thing, when they make a mistake or a shortcoming or whatever it is they do wrong, leaders should own up to it. Arrogance is equally as sinful and harmful as any sexual sin, any lie, or any other sin that you can think of committed. Jesus condemned the Pharisees for this very same thing, for their arrogance, and for not practicing what they preach. This is what he said in Matthew 23, uh, verse 3. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. All leaders, from from preaching pulpit to elders to volunteer ministries to children's ministry, whatever. Guys, you can't let arrogance get in the way. There's no room for your ego in the kingdom of Christ. Jesus Christ is the only king, and it trickles down from there. There's no room for your ego. This isn't here for you. This isn't a vanity project. We are working in different areas to strive to saving souls for Christ and uplifting those who are saved. So guys, and even ladies who are serving in certain areas of ministry, don't let your ego ever inflate. I know some people in here, they start to swell up like a balloon. If you're not careful, it's going to hit something and pop it and ruin your ministry. But we can't let egos do it, so don't let that happen to you. Lastly, under characteristics, leadership leadership people should strive to seek humility. And this goes hand in hand with sincerity, as in possession of possessing a humble heart. A few years ago, actually several years ago, one of the most well-known preachers in the country, Mark Driscoll, maybe some of you have heard of him, who was uh, the leader of a very large multi-site church called Mars Hill Church, resigned after an investigation by the elders of that church. The allegations and the testimonies of multiple church staff reported that Driscoll created an atmosphere of fear using verbal abuse and language and a lack of self-control, all stemming from an attitude of arrogant, domineering attitude. It's such a shame. And if you've ever heard or seen Mark Driscoll preach or speak publicly, you know what I'm talking about when it comes to that report. And since his departure, that multi-site church decided to break up into multiple congregations. So you see that a lack of humility in leadership can destroy a ministry. But here's what Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but to each but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ. Just like I said a minute ago, you're not going to get anywhere if you're very abusive to those who are volunteering for your ministry. I don't know how we would have got through VBS if Caroline was breaking out the whip and getting mad at us for all of our shortcomings, I don't know how it would have done. It might have broke down. We might not have had much of a program. But leaders like Caroline and others who are leading these ministries individually, if you have humility and you have Christ in your heart, you're leading with passion, you're leading with love and humility, that ministry can thrive. But it will all be destroyed if you have selfish ambition, if you have ego problems. If you're not humble enough, if you're cruel, if you're mean, it's not going to work. So these characteristics are just a few, but these are some of the main characteristics that leaders should aspire to. Whether you're already a leader or whether you're about to become one, you have to have these to succeed. Now we move on to leadership capability. Henry Ford once said that to ask who the leader should be is like asking who should sing tenor in the quartet. The tenor should sing tenor, of course, and the person who is gifted to lead should lead. You don't have bass singing your tenor, right? That's the point. The problem that plagues some churches is that they have men who have personal integrity and spirit filled but are not gifted by God to serve as leaders. Although these these men mean well, without the gift or skill to lead, it can lead to many problems. In Romans 12, Paul reminds us that the only some Christians are gifted with leadership, and those are those who should govern diligently. Romans 12, 8. So it, it's not just about characteristics, but it's also about your capabilities because God calls some to be apostles and teachers and leaders, and God calls others to do this, this, and this. Everyone's gifted to serve God. Everybody. 
Some are gifted to be leaders, some are not. Some are gifted to do this and some aren't. I know I'm not gifted to be a children's minister. And I'm sure all the people there yesterday can tell you, I tried to, to make these kids laugh and interact, but I just can't break through to them. I'm too scary or goofy to them. I don't know. But there are people, men and women, who just have such a skill to make these kids listen, to make them laugh, to make them understand. And God has gifted these individuals with that. And he might not have gifted it to me and others. But then there's also all these individuals who come up here and volunteer to lead us in worship who sing. That's gifts. And I think a lot of us can say amen that we don't have the gifts to sing or play instruments. But what would happen if God didn't gift these people with that? We'd we'd have some horrible singing, even though God will accept anything if we're doing it in sincerity and spirit and truth. But it, it does help when our worship is led by competent, gifted people, doesn't it? So we thank God for those gifts. Many things should accompany Christians that are blessed with the gift of leadership, such as decisiveness, organization, vision, and inspiration. Bob Russell points out that three other characteristics that make a culpable leader are this. First, a good, capable leader has the courageous confrontation of problems. Leaders should have the ability to distinguish between important issues and the need, immediate need, attention, to other issues that are minor and are best left to resolve themselves. And let me clarify that by saying this. John Wilson, a longtime preacher of of the first Christian church in Springfield, Ohio, suggested that when a church has problems, the leaders have to determine if it's measles or cancer. If it's measles, the problem will go away on its own. If it's cancer, it has to be eradicated. Many leaders are too afraid to confront cancerous problems. They, They simply hope it goes away on its own. And that goes from our elders down and from other ministries down, of course. You've got to confront the problems when they come. The balance between micromanaging and laissez-faire leadership is a difficult challenge, but church leaders must find the biblical middle. Another uh, characteristic Bob lists is an attitude of responsible flexibility. This concept is related to the restoration movement motto of in essentials unity, in opinions liberty, and in all things Love. When it comes to biblical truths and doctrines, such as the divinity of Christ, the resurrection, the plan of salvation, there is no compromise. However, in all matters of opinion, matters that Scripture is silent on or does give no direction on, we Christians must have the ability to work together and to push through and to make decisions without division. And leadership plays a huge part in doing that. Good leaders will know when not to make tradition or other non essential things more important or just as important as biblical doctrine. And I'll also add also the mission of saving souls for Jesus Christ. In things such as musical style, decoration, order of worship, dress, etc., leaders must be polite and objective. Good leaders will do their best to not offend the sensitive sensitivities of some, but they must not be intimidated by the vocal few. And this is something that all leaders have to do. All leaders have to be able to delegate and to be political in a sense and try to find the middle ground for people on matters that are of opinion. Another thing Bob mentions is supportive of other leaders. Preachers, deacons, and other staff members have a duty to be submissive to the authority of the eldership, and in return, the elders should be a source of encouragement to their staff. And I can go ahead and speak on this, and Tom can back me up. The elders have been supportive and encouraging to me. But it's also a back and forth thing. We have to encourage one another because it gets tough. And my job is to help encourage you because it gets tough for everyone out there, doesn't it? It gets tough trying to live the Christian life first off and then beyond that trying to witness for Christ. It gets very difficult. So it's all of our jobs. All of us are here to edify and encourage one another. And from the very top, it works the same way. The elders and the ministers and all those who are working to lead the ministries, we must encourage one another. Another one, lastly, Bob talks about proper delegation. Bob quotes a a thing called Boyle's Law, which states, if not controlled, work will flow to the most competent person until he is swamped. There's some people in here, whether it be in the church or in their own business, you, uh, you let things trickle down to you, don't you? You let all the work get on your shoulders, don't you? But you can't let that happen, because let me give you an example. In Exodus chapter 18, we see Moses 
being overwhelmed with the leadership responsibilities until his father-in-law, Jephro, advised him to train and delegate some of the responsibilities to qualified men. I love that story. I know it's not a fancy one. It's not one people talk about a lot. But I love that even Moses, almighty Moses, who was called by God to lead his people, even he was a little selfish with the responsibilities, and he thought he had to do it all. But Jephro said, what are you doing, man? You're running out of energy. You can't spread yourself that thin. And Jephro advised him, and Moses decided, well, it's good. It's a godly thing to distribute responsibilities to other men so that they can participate and serve. And we also see in Acts when the Jerusalem church grew to the extent that the 12 apostles were beginning to experience pressures, they decided to select seven men to care for the physical needs of the church so that they could spend their time preaching and teaching. And this is the time when we believe the first deaconship began, when they had to solve some of the problems of distribution of foods and other things to the different groups of Christians in that early church. The, the apostles said, we can't do this. We have to preach and, and teach. We don't have time to do this. So they called upon godly men, the first deacons, to help them and take care of the practical ministries of the church. Proper delegation skills are essential for good leadership. So today I, I spewed a lot of information to you. But a good, and I'm saying this because a healthy church and a godly church must have leaders who demonstrate strong, personal, and godly character. Leaders must display purity, sincerity, and humility. Leaders must also display the qualities and capabilities of leadership. Leaders must be decisive and organized, have vision and inspiration. Leaders need to be courageous and confront problems, be flexible when necessary, proper delegate, and be encouraging. So all those who are leaders, I warn you and challenge you to keep yourself in check. Always read 1 Timothy and Titus and ask yourself, am I living up to the standards that God wants me to live by? And to everyone else, respect your leaders, but keep them in check. Make sure that they're following God's word and encourage your leaders. Give them credit where credit is due and help them when they need help. And lastly, and most importantly, where everything I want to lead is, if God is calling you to help lead in some capacity here at Jarvisburg, pray about it. And if you feel that's the right thing and the godly thing, step up and be a leader. Because we need you to make our mission stronger. We're in a transition period of leadership. And I, our current leadership is praying about it, and we are looking for qualified men who will step up to the role of elder and deacon. We have some who've shown interest, but we need more. We need more people to step up, and we need also ladies to step up in other ministries throughout the church. Everybody here has a gift. Some of you have a gift to lead, and if you have that gift, pray about it and see if God is leading you to letting us know what you can do to help the ministry here at Jarvisburg grow. So I thank you for your time, and thank you for the word of God, because a good church is led by good leaders. And everyone's going to think I'm just trying to score brownie points. But I want to thank Gene and Carl and all of our past elders and past deacons and current ministers and Tom. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for what you've provided to us and what you're going to continue to provide for us as we continue to strive to be the church we're supposed to be in this community. Thank you. At this time, we now come to a time of invitation. And speaking of leading, if God is leading you to repent of your past sins and to put your full faith and trust in him, there's opportunity now as there is any time. But now especially, we call you to come forward with a repentant heart and confess your faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized in his name. If you have that need or any need of rededication, if you've strayed from God, you need to rededicate yourself to his service. Or if you have any prayers or any other needs at this time, don't hesitate to come forward as we sing our song of invitation as we stand.
Jenny would like to share a word. First of all, I don't write. I don't do very well explaining what I have to say. But we want to take this time right now to thank each one of you for your prayers, for all of the time you've taken to show your love to us. And, uh, you know, I'm an elder. I've been in the church all my life. But this has also been a growing process for me and for Jeannie. We both thank you and we love you. Uh, let's stand for closing prayer. And uh, before I close and pray, uh, today's sermon was not sponsored by Pepsi or Coca-Cola. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> so thank you for being here today. And if, if there's anyone here who's new today, by the way, please don't forget to stop by our welcome desk and say hi so we can get to know you. Let's go to Lord in prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for every time that we can come together on the Lord's Day and to worship you, praise your son Jesus, and uh, recognize him through communion, sing together and fellowship with one another. Lord, it's such a blessing every time we can do that. We thank you for your word and the inspiration to help inspire leaders, and we just pray that this church will uh, bring up more leaders for your son, Lord, in different ways, no matter what capacity it is, even if it's in this, just in their own community, leading others to Christ. We pray that you will empower those individuals to do so. We thank you for Carl and Jeannie. We continue to pray for Carl as he continues to uh, take his sabbatical to heal himself and to get his energy back so that he can continue to, to do what he's been doing, and that's lead you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us, all your blessings. We pray you protect us and be with us and guide us as we depart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, it is good. He's so good. 